you all know, last week it was kind of a little bit toasty warm. Um, So, uh, but we're looking, honestly, right now with the way construction's going, everything's going very quickly. Um, So we're looking at possibly being there sometime in June, and uh, we're looking forward to that. I know the mid was great this week. Um, I I really enjoyed the mid. Um, We had a good time together there, and it was a lot of fun. It was a... um, I think I enjoyed just the, the intimacy of it, being able just to be together, to get to worship the Lord. Um, but today, I've been praying a lot about where we're going as far as the Bible class. We finished the curriculum recently and um, began to pray about what God was wanting us to do and what he's wanting us to say and, and where we're going over the next few weeks. But I, I wanted to just be transparent with you all today. Um, there's... There's something happening throughout the body of Christ right now. I believe that that we're being molded in a different way, Uh, not necessarily to say anything brand new. I believe God, there's nothing new under the sun, and God will never contradict his word, but he will constantly contradict our understanding of it. Amen? That there's some things that you've heard a million times over and over and over again, and all of a sudden you'll read it again, and it'll take a brand new life to it. Something will happen, you're like, wow. But what I know that's been in my heart, especially over the last two weeks, has been I want to see what truly it means to read Scripture, to, to, to be a Christian, and see the very words and see everything that I'm feeling and sensing come off the page and become so practical, become so every single day. Because how many of you all know in here that there are some phrases that we use over and over and over again that kind of desensitize and kind of lose their impact on you because you've heard them so much. And uh, I'm the world's worst for it because I have my key phrases that I use over and over and over again. Um, Even so much so like whenever we talk about intimacy with God. Well, what does that really mean? What does that, has that lost its relevance to us because we've heard it so much? And Well, I have the favor of God on my life. Sometimes we hear those things and it's become churchanese or Christianese. And after a while, you're kind of like, well, what, what does that actually mean though? Whenever my feet hit the floor in the mornings and I roll out of bed, and I'm getting ready to, to face my day, I'm going on the job, I'm going to work, and I'm doing things, what does those things actually mean to me? What does it actually mean to follow Christ and follow after God's heart and those kind of things? And I'll be completely honest with you, I believe those phrases have lost a little bit of their edge because we've overused them so much. After a while, you've got people that come in and... I, I know in my own life, whenever I speak to certain people, whenever they're just frustrated with life, and if you throw some of those empty phrases at them, they're not empty to us, but to them, it's like, come on, I need more than that. You don't understand. It's more than just throwing a phrase at somebody and expecting them just to, their life to transform based on saying, well, you know, you got to know that you're, you're, you're truly a daughter of God. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to be a son of God? What does it mean to be a daughter? What does it mean to follow after God? Even though those are good things, but what does that mean when you are in the classroom, you're taking tests, or you're teaching uh, a bunch of children, or you're finding yourself trying to just live day after day? And what I really felt in my heart, I began to look at Jesus' life and who he is as an individual. What did people gain from being around Jesus? And who did he choose to, to create an atmosphere around himself? What kind of people did he bring around himself that caused him to be effective and that also caused every one of us to see who he was? Because I'm tired of reading scripture day after day after day and seeing things and these men in the Bible and these ladies in the Bible, they begin to just look like movie characters. That they, they weren't real, they weren't, you know, you just watch all these really cool things that they did and think they were great examples, but realistically, who are these guys? Who are these people? And what does it have to do with us in Huntington, West Virginia in 2017? What does it mean to read the book of Matthew, and what does it mean for your life, for my life? Because I don't know about you all, but I am human. I get frustrated, I get aggravated, believe it or not, I get angry. I don't get mad because dogs get mad, but I get angry at things. I get frustrated, 
And there are days that I don't always, the fruit of the Spirit is not always ripe in my life. There are days that it's rotten, and sometimes it falls off the tree, and I can't help it. And I need God to help me bridle myself, my tongue, and my intentions. Is there anybody else in here like that? That just get, just get real, I'm telling you. I am tired of, of, of moving forward in my life and acting, which I, I, I thank God that we have a, a culture here that we don't, we're very transparent of if you're frustrated, tell God, I'm frustrated. You know, I, we've talked about this so many times before of you hear people that come up to you, well, how are you today? I'm blessed and highly favored. Really? Really? Well, today I'm tired and I'm frustrated and I need God to help me to where I can bridle my tongue and not say things that are gonna be uh, hurtful to other people today. And how I know there are many people in here today that live everyday life and what that looks like. So what I begin to do and what we're gonna begin over the next few weeks is I simply begin to look at the men and we're gonna talk about some of the ladies as well, but some of the men that Jesus chose to walk beside of him and that's the disciples. Who were these men? And there's three things that I want us to take away from every single person that was chosen with him is why did he choose them? What did they bring to him? And what did they walk away from after walking with him? Because I'm telling you, I grew up watching, was it, was it Charlton Heston or something that had, or Charles Heston or whatever it is, that had the, the Ten Commandments movie that came out every Easter and it showed Moses and all these big actors and all this kind of stuff. And then we see movies even like The Passion of the Christ. Uh, you see, um, I was flipping through the channels the other day and I saw Noah that Russell Crowe was in. That was a freaky movie. <laughs> it was very freaky. Um, but I begin to just flip through channels and stuff. And so often we start looking at the disciples and they become movie characters. They, just beca they begin to just look like these different people that, and I, I grew up with flannel graph. Does anybody else in here know what flannel graph is? Please, thank God. Okay, you all really are saved. No, I'm playing. Because I, I, I grew up to believe if you didn't learn the Bible on flannel graph, you need to get saved again. But I would grew up Southern Baptist, and flannel graph was that big old flannel board that had the, the flannel backing on it that you'd push the buildings onto it, and it would stick, and then the little uh, Jesus characters and all that stuff, you'd put them on there, and it would show them just walking around. And for some reason, Jesus always had a posse around him of 12 guys that just followed him everywhere. That's not the case. I grew up thinking that they were just this group that was his entourage, and every time Jesus rolled into town, that he had this group of guys with him, and he would stop and say, lo, behold, thou art, and he would speak in perfect King James English. That's not the case at all. Most of the guys, I know at least four of them were brothers and were fishermen, I don't know how many of you all have been around fishermen, but I know one thing that's synonymous with fishermen is they lie. <laughs> they lie. And sometimes they, I, I got tickled. I grew up with a gentleman who, bless his heart, he lost an arm in the war. And, um, and I think it was Vietnam, he actually lost his arm. And he, but he was a big fisherman, I grew up with him. And uh, his name was Tad. And he would tell, it was so funny with all the kids because he would tell us, man, I went fishing the other day. You know what? And now remember, he didn't have an arm. He said, I caught a fish. It was that long. There, he didn't have an arm to show us where it ended. <laughs> so it was always constant. It was that long. So you never knew how big the fish was. But you had people that, you had fishermen. These guys were just regular people. But now here's the thing. And this is what I want to do over the next few weeks is, well, let's talk about who they were as individuals, who, what they brought to the table, and what Jesus did in them individually. And the first one, if you've got a Bible app, I want you guys to turn. Um, let's go into Matthew, because Matthew, and we're going to talk about each disciple, because I believe that we, and the more I read about these people and these guys, I find myself in their stories over and over and over again. But let's go to Matthew 10. That's the first um, we see, because what I want to talk about today is first off of how they're called. Because in Matthew 10, you have the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you have in those Gospels, most of the time, some of it's redundant 
And I'm gonna kinda just kinda explain a few of these because this is how I was taught and it helped me understand this so much. The four gospels, many times you'll see the same accounts of things over and over and over because it was different people writing in it. It was different, God used different apostles and, and disciples to write those gospels. And the reason being a lot of times, and I love this, is you'll see the slant on each disciple that was writing the book. So Matthew tells it from one perspective, Mark tells it from another, uh, Luke will tell it from another, and John, we'll get to him, he's one of my favorites because he is, he's a little prideful, and what we're going to see today is he's called very close to when Peter was called, and they grew up together. And so John has a different perspective on things, but Matthew kind of is a little bit of a neutral person who brought in a lot of just facts. So anytime you're reading the Bible and you begin to see redundancies, that's why, is because it's actually four men actually just beginning to speak out something. And it's like this, the way that scripture is, and I've given this analogy before, is we believe that the Bible, you hear about the Bible being inspired by God. All that means is God breathed it. And the way that I liken that, and every time that we read, you can read all these different authors, is my breath can, if I blow into a clarinet, which you would not wanna hear, if I blow into a clarinet, it's gonna sound one way. But if I blow into a saxophone, Bobby, you know what it would sound like. I would, if Bobby blew into it, it would sound one way, but if I blew into it, it would sound completely different. If I blow into a trumpet, it sounds different. If I blow into a tuba, very different. But it's still my breath in every single one of them. So that's what God did in each d disciple, in each apostle. He breathed his breath, the same breath, but a different instrument. And sometimes what you're gonna see with Peter is he's a little bit of a tuba. Because with Peter, I love him because I, 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 I relate to all of them, but I really relate to Peter because you're gonna see a few things in here. But let's go to Matthew 10. We're gonna be in the New King James. But I wanna tell you at, at the top of this, and we're gonna go back a little bit in a moment, but Matthew 10, let's go ahead and read in the New King James in verse one. Oh, hi, Zach. Awesome. Matthew 10, 1, and when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now, the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, comma, Simon, who is also called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. Let's stop right there very quickly. You see that there's a colon there, and it says, first, Simon, who is called Peter. First in the Greek is the same thing as chief. So I always thought that the disciples just kind of roamed around in bands with him and, and Jesus wore the white thing and had a blue sash. He always had a blue sash on every single time in every picture for some reason. But I always thought that they all were just level and he always sat on a rock and they all just were scattered around him. They had a little bit of a hierarchy not in a bad way, but they did have a leader in among them, and it was Peter. So first actually meant chief. Simon, who is called Peter, Simon's an extremely common name in Scripture because you, you see like 15 Simons in the New Testament. But who is called Peter? Another translation says it, and another uh, writer says it this way, who is also called Peter. Peter is special because God did not rename him. He added a name to him. Simon was his professional name. That would be just like me calling, I'm going to pick on you today, Bobby. I'm gonna, it, it would be like, Bobby, but I'm going to call him Bulldog. <laughs> I'm going to call him Bulldog just because I, I, that's his nickname. What God did is we've, we've learned about Paul and how God changed his name completely. He didn't necessarily do that with Peter. What he did with Peter, he didn't necessarily change his name. He added to him. And what he did was something neat. In Simon, whenever he would refer to him as Simon, as we're going to see a few places, it was because of one thing. But whenever he would call him Peter, because Jesus looks at him and says, you're no longer going to be called just Simon, just Simon. He didn't do away with him and who he originally was. He just added to him. And so he said, now what I'm going to call you is Cephas. And Cephas translated as Peter, which meant rock. So this really, what he did with Peter, and you see, and Andrew, his brother, I love it. How many of you all have siblings that are younger than you? I'm gonna put my hand down. I don't, I have an older brother. Awesome. 
they can very often kind of hide in the shadows. Andrew hid in the shadow a lot of time of Peter. But you had a young man named Peter. Now, let me tell you a little bit of his background of who he is. He was a young man that lived in Capernaum that was the heir to a fishing business. I kind of like that. Have you ever seen The Deadliest Catch? I like Wicked Tuna right now. That's one of my favorite ones. I love watching them catch those huge fish. But this young man was an heir. Not He wasn't just a fisherman. He was an heir to a fishing company. I've said this to somebody before. Of you know, You're not just a fisherman. You own a fishing business. There's a big difference. Whenever you're just a, uh, a carpenter or you own a carpentry company, there is a difference. Instead of just being the, the person who works for when you own it, and now you have people working for you. No doubt, though, he started as a regular fisherman because that's one of the things that you see regularly is one of the things he always did was he fished. He was always out on a boat somewhere doing something. And we see there's a couple times later on that he actually finds himself back in that same trade. But there's always a progression inside of his heart, and I'm gonna kind of paraphrase just a little bit here. But let's go ahead and read. Let's go back to Matthew. I wanna go into Matthew 4. Matthew 4, 18. And it says this, And Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Now, every time that I always read this, and I would see this on TV, you had these two oblivious guys who were Jewish out working in a boat, and then all of a sudden they see this random guy begin to call to them, says, come and follow me, and I shall make you fishers of men. They go, boom, all right, let's do this. How odd, does that strike anybody as odd? Of, to me, it did, because growing up, I would watch this on TV, or I'd watch those little Bible videos or flannel graph, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, that couldn't have been that easy. Because I don't know what happened around that, but there was something in my heart. If this young man had went from a fisherman to where he's now a fi- fixing to inherit a fishing business, in my heart, when I know how I am. It would be hard for me if, if, if it would be easier for me to leave everything if something wasn't already in my heart for it to begin with. I believe that it wasn't as hard for Peter to leave something so familiar because there was something that had been stirring in him a lot longer than what we see written down by Matthew. There's something stirring in him that he knows there's something more. There's got to be more to this thing. And I don't know, it says that he was raised Jewish, but there, I believe in my, I know in my own personal life, before I'm gonna forsake anything, there's going to be a confirmation. There's going to be a stirring in my heart. For instance, if you, if all of a sudden this random girl just comes up to you and says, hey, I want, let's get married. Okay. How odd is that? But it's different whenever you have a desire and you know that God's placed marriage in your heart. You know, I heard a testimony yesterday, many of you all did, of God, if you'll just give me a good woman, I'll, I'll, if you'll just do this, if you... If there's a desire in your heart that leans toward marriage, that leans toward a person, and then that person begin, and you begin to be in relationship with them, and you begin to, to interact, and you fall in love, it's a lot easier whenever they say, hey, let's get married. Absolutely. Because my heart's already leaned into that. And I believe that the Holy Spirit, and I believe it's all across the board, that God will put a desire in your heart long before many times he'll give you the opportunity. I know I've seen that in my own life. Whether it's a job, whether it's something that you you feel and you sense that, you know what, I'm supposed to do this and there's no door open. And sometimes that's the most frustrating place though is when God births something in your heart and um, and let me rephrase that because that's, I feel like I'm kind of catching myself when I say God births something in your heart. Sometimes that sounds a little ethereal and out there. When you have something in your heart that becomes something you think about all the time, 
You can't get it off your mind. Does anybody have something like that in your mind? There's something that just, it burns in your mind and it burns in your heart, almost makes you sick because you're constantly thinking about it. Whether it's a job, whether it's a relationship, I know in my own heart relationships can do that. Whether it's between friends, whether it's between colleagues or your significant other, your spouse, those things, that for some reason, it becomes a passion inside of your heart. And many times, God, you, there'll be a desire come into your life, but no open door. And it's frustrating for a while. It's frustrating and it's aggravating. I know in my own life there have been moments that I know I'm supposed to be doing something. For instance, when I first moved to West Virginia, I had music in my heart. I always wanted to be a studio musician, a singer. Um, I didn't even know yet that I wanted to be a worship leader. I had no clue. But I knew that I was supposed to do something in music. I knew that I was gifted. I knew that I was talented. Um, God had just given that to me, and it came easy to me. And so when I first moved to West Virginia, I fully expected to come up here and find my way in music. And that I was going to find, there was going to be some open door. And it felt like every single open door that I would walk over to slam shut in my face. And then I would try something else over here. I'd try, well, maybe I could, I could make a living as a, a background vocalist. And anybody in here that knows music knows that's not happening because those are few and far between. So I would be happy for a small little paycheck once every couple months. And I found myself, that door just slammed in my face. And then I thought, well, maybe I could do this. And that door slammed. And I remember getting so frustrated because I... Here I am with music in my heart, knowing I'm supposed to do it, and no outlet. No outlet at all. And I remember getting up, and, and we, we went to a church out in Salt Rock that was one that uh, Dale actually grew up in. And I would get up, and I would sing a special every now and then. I would sit back down, and in my heart, there was something burning. So I began to talk um, to people around me about, well, what are you going to do? And people begin to say, well, you need to just get in college. You just need to get a good education. You need to go into a field that you know is always going to be stable and you're always going to have money, that you're going to be able to just do that thing. So I enrolled in nursing school, and I have so much respect for nurses. Oh, my gosh. I was in nursing school for such a long time, and I was there for four years. And I'll never forget one of my instructors looking at me saying, you're not a nurse. I'm like, I know. <laughs> You're not telling me something I don't know. I know this. I'm not gifted in this. This is, I, I can do it, but it's not my passion. And she was like, what are you doing here? And this was four years into it, and I was like, good Lord, I wish I'd have had this conversation a year in. But actually, that advisor looked at me. She said, I'll tell you what, dude. She said, you, you've come this far. You need to go into this type of bachelor's to be able to graduate, but you really need to Go out and seek what it is that you're called to be. This was an, an instructor from Marshall. Thank God for God has people everywhere. I'm telling you, that's what God means whenever he said in the scripture, if I've got sheep you don't know about, he's got people in places that you don't even know he's got them. And I had an advisor, and she looked at me, and she said, you'll graduate this year. And she said, um, but I want to encourage you. She said, you need to find a profession. She said, you need to find exactly what that passion is. And she knew, because this was the same teacher, that I had written a song for a class. She was like, well, duh, that's what you're supposed to be doing. I'm like, I know, but I can't get there, and it, I can't do it. But I went through that process, and I would not trade those four years for anything in this world. Because what that taught me was there was so much through that whole process that I learned that now was being transplanted into my future. Being able to be organized, being able to think and expand my mind because that's what was going on during those college years whenever there was still no open door. I was playing bass for, our college, for a college group at Christ Temple. And it was because Matt Hale asked me to come play bass for him to fill in for two weeks, and two weeks turned into two years. And that's all I was doing. No one knew I could sing. No one knew. All I was doing was playing bass and background, which I was happy to do. I was glad to do. I, Pastor Ronnie was there. And I'll never forget one night 
Whenever every door was shut, I remember being frustrated, not knowing which way to go, not sure what was gonna happen next and playing bass and being grateful for doing that because I was, I was glad to back up people but stood in the background for a long time. And then suddenly, one night, Pastor Kevin walked in and looked at me and said, you, you I want you to pro begin to sing and prophesy from the bass. And whatever you sing is what I'm gonna preach from. And we're gonna wait on you. <laughs> and I nearly peed my pants because I had never done that before. I had sang before, but not like this. Not like this was different. This was completely different. And so I stood up there what felt like 15, 20 minutes. It was probably only two, or it might have been more, I don't know. And I began to tune my bass, and then all of a sudden, something began. I started to sing, and I'd never sang this thing before. It just began to come out, and I couldn't stop it. And then all of a sudden, Pastor comes up, Pastor Kevin comes up, and he, he begins to minister from what I was singing. There was something sparked in me that I was like, oh my goodness, that's it. I don't know what that is, but that's it. I don't even have a name for it, but oh, that's, that was it. And then the next thing I knew, hey, can you come minister with me over here? Absolutely, absolutely, I'm there. Oh, well, okay, well, can you lead worship? Yes. And the next thing I knew, it, was a, it wasn't just a door, it was a portal. And I graduated from Marshall, I finished. That was a big deal was I finished what I started. I didn't abandon midstream and say, I'm gonna jump out right here because I know there's some waves coming up. No, no, I graduated Marshall and I finished what God had called me to for that season, but then all of a sudden, the door swung open wide and that was the first time that music became a true avenue for me to begin to walk in and, to, and many of you I met through that. Many of the things... What I felt in that moment was bigger than a door, was a portal, was the same thing Peter felt when he said, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I've been fishing all night. There's one account that says that's how he came to him. I've been doing this a long time. I've been faithful in it. There's a future in this. If I keep this pathway going, there's security in it. I could become something great. I could be the next youngest fisher boat owner. I could, I could create something huge. But I'm hearing something come from over there that even though my mind is here, my heart is there. And I don't even know what that looks like but I can't stop thinking about it. I know I'm supposed to think about this right now and this is what's gonna provide bread and, and it's gonna give me money, but man, there's something about what he's saying to me that just smells like where I wanna go. Have you ever experienced that? I've heard of people whenever I, they're in the middle of things like that and they, they abandon security to jump out onto faith. And all faith is is putting your foot out in nothing and you don't even know what it's called. And I remember doing that and pressing and remember, and that's what it means to be led by the Spirit. You hear that said so many times to the point that you become desensitized to it, but that's what it means is when your head is thinking one thing, but then your heart just burns and says, there's something about that that's just not right. And you begin to listen and watch for the open door that takes you into that season that you're supposed to be in. God will open those doors. And they won't just be doors, they're portals. They're portals. Because I remember, I remember growing up playing Super Mario. And there was always those green tunnels. And you'd just hit the down button and you'd bloop, bloop, bloop. And it would transform you into a brand new place. And he would go through doors and he would do these things. And that's what Peter was doing on a fishing boat, was he was just walking through doors open and open. But suddenly one day there was a portal opened up for him that was going to transport him into a brand new place that he'd never been before. How many of you all know God does that every single day? And many times it's through people. Because we are the voice and the mouthpiece of God for somebody. So what I could be speaking to you today is a portal for you to hear what God is really calling for you to be in your life. What you're seeing and whenever you, what is it that brings God pleasure whenever you're doing it? Whenever you do it and you know that you could do it like the back of your hand. I've watched a young man down at the property 
build, and he's a framer. And I'm telling you, I've never seen anybody in, I've seen it happen in music with my own life, but I'm telling you, when he swings a hammer, there's an anointing on him swinging a hammer. I've watched John Barnhart draw out plans, and I'm thinking, my Lord, look at this. And it's just, it's pleasure, and it's exactly what God's called them to, and he can speak for God through a hammer. He can speak for God through a pencil. Well, that's what Peter was getting ready to find himself in. But he says, let's, let's read this in uh, Matthew 4, 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. He called them and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. These are two fishing businesses. How many of you all know fishing business is competitive? I'm pretty, sure, I'm pretty sure if they're on the Sea of Galilee that fishermen can be very competitive. I caught more than you. I can, I can do this better than you. So he not only called two brothers from one fishing business, he called two more from another fishing business who possibly were rivals. We don't know. But now they're being called and asked to walk together into something. How many of you all know sometimes God will save your rivals and bring you and put you on the right path together to accomplish more than you could individually. Because that's, I believe, what he was doing, specifically with John. Because as we're gonna see through scripture over the next few weeks, there's something happens different with John. Because every time he talks about Peter, you can see it's, it's laced with some of John's personal feelings. But Peter, as we're gonna see, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through this very quickly, because I want you guys, if you get a chance, just begin to read the Gospels. Because you're gonna see men interacting as men. And he's called in Matthew 4. But the thing I love about Peter is three things that he took away constantly as he's, God, I believe, or Jesus, I believe, chose him specifically because he knew that he would be the one that we all could model ourselves from because he was a basket case sometimes. I love how one writer said it. He had a, a foot-shaped mouth because he was constantly putting his foot in his mouth. He was constantly asking questions. He constantly, because every single time that Jesus would be speaking something, Peter was always the one saying, hey, what does that mean? What does that mean? Okay, really? Because I have no idea what you just said. Because I'm telling you, you begin to read some of the parables that Jesus spoke, and honestly, it will, it, they'll confuse you. And Peter's the first one that says, you're confusing us, please make this simple. That's pretty much what he said. Because, and what's funny is Jesus would just answer him with another parable. And I can just see Peter there looking at him saying, I do not understand the words that are coming out of your mouth. Can you please make this more practical for us? And he was constantly the one asking the right questions to get the best relevant answer to be able to walk this thing out. But he had, I loved... There's four things that he said in Matthew 15. He asked him, he said, explain the parables to us because I'm not getting this. In Luke 12, he said, I love this because this is so me. I, I like being exclusive a little bit if I love being the first to know something. Now, I'll share it with everybody, but that's just my nature. How many of y'all are like that? I like to know, I like to be on the front end of things, and I believe that's a leadership trait. I believe that that's just a, a pure leadership trait of I always want to know exactly what's happening before anybody else knows it. I'll, because I'll still relay it though. It's not that I'm, I'm, this is only mine. But I just wanna know because if I know, it means I'm, the, I'm close to the central point. I'm close to the very thing that's happened. I wanna know what God's saying. I wanna be the first one to hear it because that lets me know I'm right where I'm supposed to be in close relationship with God. So Peter asks an amazing question. Whenever Jesus is telling about the end times and he's telling all these parables and stuff, Peter not only asks, he not only asks, whoa, he not only asks, well, what does this mean? He says, hey, are we the only ones getting in on this? Are, are we the only ones that you're telling this to? And Jesus is like, no, no, I, I'm, you're gonna, thousands and millions are going to read this one day. You're not the only ones. But Peter had to know. He's like, are, are we the only ones really getting this? And 
I love how Jesus handled Peter was he would begin to take him deeper and deeper into something that when he didn't, felt like he didn't understand, he would take him deeper to where he really wouldn't understand. How many of you all ever feel like that's what God does for you sometimes? Is about the time that you'll start understanding something, all of a sudden it just goes deeper. And all of a sudden you feel like you got life figured out, and then all of a sudden, boom, the bottom drops out, and you're like, oh my gosh, I did not see that coming. That's what God continually did with Peter was he began to bring him down, and then suddenly when Peter would get kind of cocky and arrogant, saying, oh, I've got this now, boom, he would take him even deeper to experience more. And then another funny, he, in Matthew 18 and 19, he asked two more questions, which I love because it's just indicative of his nature. He said, out of the blue, he, he was very random, and he would just ask these weird questions. One was, how many times am I supposed to forgive people? How many times am I supposed to forgive? What in the world was he talking about? And I, I would like to think, because this, this account is very close to them telling that Peter did have a wife. So I think he might have even attached that to, how many times am I supposed to forgive her? Because she's getting on my nerves. But he's asking those random questions over and over and over again. And he finds himself constantly wrapped up in those kind of things because he asks the questions. He's the one that jumps out and takes initiative when all others won't. And it's not, it's just the leader in him that causes him to be inquisitive and curious to jump out because what are the, some of the biggest things we see in the New Testament is when Peter jumps out, on, out of the boat onto the water and he begins to walk towards Jesus. And so many times we get frustrated when we see him begin to sink and say, well, he took his eyes off the Lord. Look where he was. Look where he, he was one of the only disciples that actually got to do some of the most amazing miracles that were ever recorded. But just like that, he also was the only disciple that was ever called Satan by Jesus. And I know in my own heart how that had to hurt him because he had been, he, we hear it all the time, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. He was the squeaky wheel that God, Jesus was constantly greasing constantly. It was constant, just, you're okay, I love you, I'm affirming you, but then suddenly, in a moment, Jesus looks at him, and he's telling him about whenever he's going to go to the cross, and, and Peter comes over to the side, pulls him off, and this is how brazen he is, and I love it. He pulls him off to the side as, as a friend, and says, it, one scripture even says that he rebukes Jesus, and he says it like this, he said, that's not going to happen to you. That, that's not going to happen to you. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, get thee behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me. How much Peter loved Jesus and Jesus just called him, get behind me, Satan. In other words, he, he looked at him and said, I, I know you think what you're saying is right, but you're not even seeing this clearly. You're not even seeing the true what I'm fixing to walk into. You're not seeing this. You're actually trying to get this thing out of order. You're actually trying to move me into a place that I was never intended for whenever you're trying to stop me from accomplishing the very thing that has, I've been put on this earth to do. So get behind me, Satan. Get out of my pathway. Get out of my forward momentum. So Peter, it's hard when it, it comes with a price whenever you do want to, like me, you want to be on the cutting edge of things and you want to be the first. It comes with the high price. Because those of you who understand this and you know this to be true, whenever you're the one that lives with no fear and you're jumping out on things, you also are some of the first people to get hurt. You're some of the first people to really understand what disappointment is, to understand what rebuke is, to understand what those things are. And that's what Peter recognized is that he's one of the first ones that we see so many times throughout the Bible as he's right there in the middle of everything. He's in, he's doing these things, but suddenly he gets this stern rebuke. And then we keep going, and we're going to finish this up next week, because I want to talk about where God took him as a person, as a man, because he constantly put his foot in his mouth. He constantly had passion and a drive and a zeal that put him on the edge of things where most disciples were jealous, and most people were jealous to see him walk in because haters are going to hate. 
When you begin to succeed and you begin to get the drive behind you, and some people would really love to live in your portal that you've been in, but they're not willing to pay what you paid to get there. There's a lot of people that would love to ride the coattails of many people that jump out into nothing, but they're just not willing to see what it feels like to operate when, hey, there's no money. Hey, there's, there's no time. We're gonna do this in two weeks and it's really gonna take people two months, but we're gonna do it in two weeks. Some people can't live in that even though they want to. But we're gonna see next week how that Peter, though, had compassion and learned how to be a forerunner, to go ahead and trailblaze, to set a path, and then welcome people to go ahead and ride his coattails, to begin to walk in that path with him because he recognized who he was, in, who he was walking beside of Jesus every single day and being humbled every single day under the hand of God. Amen? All right, we'll get start back next week. Love you all. See you at 11.